Okay, uh, so good afternoon, uh, probably good morning and uh, good evening to the, the participants around the world. So welcome to the uh, second keynote session of FAW. Uh, I'm Chong Shou Liao with National Chung University. So uh, today is my pleasure uh, to uh, host this keynote session, uh, which is going to be given by Professor Zhi Yi Huang. So Professor Huang, uh, uh, he's uh, with the Department of Computer Science uh, of uh, the University of Hong Kong. And he received uh, his PhD from UPenn and then one year postdoc at the Stanford University. So he has many uh, beautiful and uh, excellent work uh, appear in Star Fox and Soda and even uh, the best paper award uh, in 2020 in Fox. So uh, he made uh, many uh, significant contribution uh, in the fields of algorithmic gallery and online matching. So today he's going to talk about uh, the recent progress in online matching. So let's welcome Professor Zhi Yi Huang. Okay, uh, thanks Cheng Shou for the very generous introduction. And I would like to also thank the organizers for inviting me here to give what is my first in-person talk in, uh, since the pandemic. So hopefully my skills are not too rusty. Um, okay, so today I'm going to uh, share some recent progress in the topic of online matching. And uh, here's the agenda. So uh, since this uh, general audience in theoretical computer science, so we're going to spend uh, like 10, 15 minutes to cover some of the basic model and results uh, from classical online matching theory. And honestly, if online matching is a new topic to you, uh, this first part is probably more valuable than anything else in the rest of the talk. Uh, it's really a beautiful theory developed more than 30 years ago. And then uh, I'm going to um, share some recent progress that I try to um, sort of uh, cluster into three different directions. Uh, first, that has we, we have seen the, um, the, the the literature resolve some very long-standing open problems in online matching, uh, especially with applications in online advertising. And we have also seen a extension of the traditional online matching theory to more general models that can capture some of the modern applications like right sharing, uh, right hailing. And finally, um, there has been some recent work um, that improve the state of the art of online matching models uh, with stochastic information. So um, in this talk, I'm going to mostly share uh, results from my own work because um, those are the results that I'm most familiar with and has the most to share. But uh, really any of the progress in these three directions are done um, by the whole literature. And uh, I'm going to try to give some pointers to works done by others in uh, each of these three directions. All right, so uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce this model introduced by Kap Vazirani Vazirani in 1990. So in online bipartite matching, we're going to consider a bipartite graph. Uh, we're going to denote the left-hand side vertices by uh, U and the right-hand side vertices by V. And unlike the usual bipartite matching problem that you know and love and know the algorithm for it, in this case, we do not know the entire graph uh, right in the beginning. So at the beginning, we only know the left-hand side vertices and we're going to call them offline vertices. And then the vertices on the right-hand side uh, will arrive one by one. And when each online vertex arrives, uh, the algorithm will get to observe the incident edges, meaning the, the neighborhood of this vertex. And also at this very moment, uh, we need to immediately decide how to match this vertex. And once this decision is made, that's permanent. We cannot regret and change it later. And for this introduction part, we're going to focus on a very simple objective, simply try to maximize the number of edges in the matching. So um, it's better to see this through example, and let's consider a very simple greedy algorithm where when an online vertex arrives, I simply match it to an arbitrary unmatched neighbor. And in the sample run, I'm going to match it to the topmost unmatched neighbor. So at the beginning, I only know the left-hand side offline vertices. Uh, when the first vertex arrives, I get to see that, okay, it is neighbor to the second and fifth offline vertex on the left. And according to my description, I'm going to match it to the topmost unmatched neighbor, which will be the second vertex on the left. 
when the second vertex arrives, uh, match it to the first one, and so on. And at some point, it may be possible that the topmost neighbor is already matched, and in which case, we will go to the next one. Uh, remember, we're matching to the topmost unmatched neighbor. And also at some point, we may find that, okay, both neighbors are already matched. And in which case, uh, we will have no choice but to leave this uh, online vertex unmatched because, well, I, I simply have no available options. But in hindsight, uh, it is possible that we find that, okay, we should have done things differently uh, earlier. For example, in the sample run, uh, if we know the entire graph upfront, then there's actually a perfect matching as shown on the right-hand side. So because of this lack of information about what future vertices may arrive, uh, the algorithm has to make some suboptimal decision at some point. The question is, how much efficiency did we lost? So to quantify this, we're going to compare the number of edges matched by the algorithm with the uh, number of edges in the optimal matching in hindsight and call this the competitive ratio, which we try to maximize, okay? So, um, well, since this is a TCS audience, you will probably see that, okay, it's not just about the competitive ratio of one instance. Well, we are going to do some worst case analysis. So once you give me the algorithm, I'm going to examine what is the smallest possible value of this compare ratio uh, among all the possible input by higher graph that you can give me and all the possible arrival order. So um, that would be the compare ratio of the algorithm. All right, so um, there are some good news and bad news about the greedy algorithm. First of all, it is not too hard to see that the greedy algorithm will be one half competitive, meaning that the number of edges that it managed to match will be at least one half of the number of edges in the optimal matching. And this is actually a, I would say, undergraduate uh, algorithm course exercise, uh, not too hard to figure out. But the bad news here is, here is that this one half is also the best thing that you can claim under worst case analysis. And in fact, not, not just for the greedy algorithm that I designed, but actually for any deterministic algorithm. And to see this, uh, it suffices to look at this, uh, this very simple graph with only two offline vertices and two online vertices. Uh, just to highlight the, the difficulty of making online decisions without knowing what's going to happen in the future. The first online vertex is neighbor to both offline vertices. Now, at this point, I have to choose one of them, right? And up to this point, I really have no useful information to tell me which one is better. So let's say I simply match it to the bottom one. Now, if the second vertex is only neighbor to the bottom one, then we will see that we have made a mistake in the first round. In the optimal matching, I would have get the two parallel edges and get a size of two, but the algorithm only get one and it's already blocking the next one. And really, if your algorithm is being deterministic, there's nothing better that you can do. Even if you choose to match the top one, then you cannot handle the alternative case where the second vertex is neighbor only to the top vertex instead of the second one. Now, staring at this example, it is natural to guess, okay, maybe randomization would help, right? For this example, if I randomly choose which neighbor to match to in the first round, then I would guess correctly with probability one half. And when I guess correctly, I actually get both edges. So it seems using randomization would help here. But the problem here is that a naive way of introducing randomness into the picture does not work either. So what, what do I mean by a naive randomized greedy algorithm? Well, when each online vertex arrives, I look at what are the unmatched neighbors, and then I'm going to flip some coins and randomly choose one of these unmatched neighbors to match to. So that would be a natural way to introduce things, but it will fail on the following example, which is sort of a um, amplified version of the Z-shaped worst case scenarios uh, that we just seen. So in this case, I have many vertices, let's say N vertices, two N vertices on the left and two N vertices on the right, and I break it into two half. The top half have uh, M vertices on each side, the bottom half, same thing here. And there's this one perfect matching in this graph, okay? So in principle, we should be getting a perfect matching of size 2N. However, I'm going to introduce a lot of uh, wrong edges to fool the algorithm. So for, from the top right and the bottom left, I'm going to introduce a complete uh, bipartite graph. So this is sort of the wrong uh, diagonal edge in the Z-shaped graph, except that now I make it a complete graph. And the right-hand side on line vertices is going to arrive from top to bottom. Now you can see that when each of the top half on line vertices arrive, there's only one correct choice. 
but there are many wrong choices. And when the naive random randomized algorithm is trying to choose a random unmatched neighbor to match to, then most of the time, uh, we're gonna still choose one of these wrong edges. And at the end, we sort of have a almost a perfect matching from the top right and the bottom left, but then the, the top part of the offline side and the bottom of the online side, most of the vertices will stay unmatched. And therefore we only get, again, a compare ratio of roughly one half. Okay, so this seems to suggest that, okay, maybe randomization does not help too much. Now comes the pleasant surprise um, given by Kalp Vazirani and Vazirani that actually shows that a smarter way to introduce randomness actually worked. So they introduced this algorithm called ranking the way it does is that at the very beginning, I'm going to randomly um, rank all the offline vertices, basically give them a priority, okay? And then when each online vertex arrives, I simply match it to the highest rank unmatched neighbor. Now, what's the difference between ranking and the naive randomized algorithm? Well, basically the difference here is that I'm using the same rank for all the online vertices instead of coming up with a new rank, new random rank in each round. So I'm introducing some, introducing some kind of a uh, carefully designed correlation among the randomness used in different rounds. And by doing so, what they show here is that, well, I, let, let's see a sample, sample run first. Uh, let's say the numbers here are the rank of the vertices and the smaller, the high, higher the priority. And in this sample run, then the first vertex is going to match the bottom one because the bottom one has the highest rank. And when a second vertex comes, it is important that I keep using the same set of ranks for all the vertices. I'm not going to resample. And in this case, it's going to match the second one and so on and so forth. Now, in this case, I basically um, choose the rank carefully so that I actually get a perfect matching. But in reality, sometimes you get uh, lucky and sometimes you get unlucky. And what I'm trying to show here is that uh, over expectation of all the random ranks that you may uh, draw in the, in the beginning, the expected number of size of the matching is going to be good. And what they show here, uh, I, I should have put a number here, uh, is that ranking is one minus one over E competitive, which is something like uh, 0.632. So it is strictly better than one half that you would get by deterministic algorithm and by the naive randomized greedy algorithm. Okay, so. Um, what Kalvazirani Vazirani did in the analysis is a little bit too complicated to be shared uh, in this introductory talk. But fortunately, about 10 years ago, uh, Devalu, Kleinberg, and Jane um, introduced a very interesting, uh, back then they call it a uh, randomized primal due analysis, but I would like to repackage it as sort of an economic viewpoint of this ranking algorithm that is so clean and it can be shared within uh, this talk. So instead of thinking about uh, randomly coming up up with a rank of all the vertices. Here, I'm going to consider a fractional rank. So for each offline vertex, I'm going to draw a random number uniformly between zero and one, and independently for different offline vertices. And effectively, I'm going to use these fractional ranks to induce a order, a priority of all the offline vertices. The smaller this yu is, the higher the priority. Uh, but instead of saying that, I'm going to say that, okay, each offline vertex is going to um, well, basically set a price according to this random number y. And you can see that each offline vertex u uh, is going to have a gain of e to the y minus one, which is the increase function of y, and that's the price. And then when a two vertices match, the offline vertex gets the price that it sets, and the online vertex gets one minus the price, basically the remaining value of the, the, the match. And if each online vertex trying to maximize its own gain, then that would naturally correspond to choosing the unmatched neighbor that has the smallest y, which actually corresponds to the definition of ranking through this reduction. But here we are sort of interpreting ranking as everyone just setting a random price for itself and then let the market coordinate the whole matching process. Okay, so um, in this analysis, what we're gonna do is going to analyze for each edge UV, what is the expected amount of gain that is going to uh, collect by the two endpoints U and V. And at the end, I'm gonna show you that if you can have a very good bound for this expected amount of gain collected by the two endpoints for any edge, then you actually have a comparative analysis and you can show that the cardinality of your uh, ranking algorithm is good. 
Uh, but this is a rather complicated random process because uh, every single offline vertex is going to randomly draw a rack. There's a lot of randomness in this process. So to simplify our task, I'm actually going to fix the ranks of all the offline vertex other than U arbitrarily, okay? And I'm only keeping the randomness of U itself. And even out after this restriction, I'm going to show you that the expected amount of gain collected by U and V uh, is going to be good enough. Okay, so instead of having n dimensional of randomness, I'm going to simplify the task to focus on only one simple random draw, use rec. And I'm going to characterize how does how does the matching result of the two relevant vertices U and V changes as use rank changes between zero and one. And if I can do that, then I can characterize that game. Okay, so um, now let's instead of Giving the full proof, let's go a little bit high level here. Intuitively, use rank uh, corresponds to its popularity. The smaller its rank, the lower the price that it sets for itself, the more popular that it becomes. The higher the rank, the higher the price is, and then the less popular you is, right? So you can imagine that there should exist some kind of a threshold rank such that below that threshold rank, U is popular enough to be matched to someone. Someone will pick you at some point. And once U's rank get above that threshold, its price is too high and no one wants U in the whole process and U is going to stay unmatched, okay? This takes a proof, but I think intuitively everyone can believe the existence of this threshold rank. Um, okay, so now this definition of threshold rank should give us a simple characterization. If use rank is smaller than theta, U has to be matched. That's the definition, right? Now, if use rank um, is larger than theta, okay, meaning that by definition, U is unmatched, right? Then V has to get matched because since U is unmatched, then v, when V arrives, there exists at least one unmatched neighbor, in specifically U, right? So V has to get matched. But what's a little bit untrue here is that that conclusion holds not only when you use rank is above theta, actually it holds for um, throughout the spectrum. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. Okay, so let's, let's do it one at a time. Uh, first, I'm going to look at the easy case uh, where use rank is actually above theta. I wanna claim that I can say something that's stronger than just saying that V is match. I can actually say something about V's match quality. I want to say that V has to match to someone whose rank is at most theta. So meaning that the, the neighbor that V pick is going to set a price that is at most as high as what you would set when his rank is theta. Now, why is that? Well, in the whole spectrum, when U's rank is above theta, well, U is not participating in the, in the matching process, right? It's unmatched by definition. So if U is not participating in the, in the matching process, its precise value of rank does not matter, right? If it's unmatched, it's unmatched. So what that means is that V is going to be matched to the same neighbor, even if use rank is very, very, very close to theta. And what that also means is that even when use rank is very close to theta, V would prefer who it matches to over you. That's why you will stay unmatched, right? So that means V's match neighbor has to have a rank that is MO theta. Otherwise, well, that would not be the threshold rank. V would have chosen U instead of its match neighbor when its rank is very close to theta, okay? So that's the first part. When use rank is sort of higher than the threshold, then we can say that V's match and also its match quality is at least as good as theta. Now we get to the most difficult part is that even when use rank is below the threshold, this match quality is that still at least as good as theta. And that comes to the critical observation that when use threshold becomes lower than the threshold, uh, the rank becomes lower than the threshold, what is happening is that you now participate in this matching process. Now the claim here is that all that it does is that it triggers an alternating path. So here the blue match is what the matching would be when U's rank is above the threshold, when U is not matched. Now with rank, with U participating in the matching, then at some point it's going to grab by some vertex V1. What that happens is that, okay, 
the original match neighbor in the blue matching for B1 called U1 is going to be a, become available. And at some point that might trigger another change and so on and so forth. The point here is that, okay, every single change is triggered by the fact that from some VI's point of view, there's one additional option. And from VI's point of view, that additional option is better than its original option in the blue matching. So every single online vertex in this alternating path is choosing a better option. So in other words, not only that it triggers the alternating path, the effect of this alternating path is only making all, any online vertex better instead of getting worse. So since V itself is, has the match quality of at least theta, with U involved, that can only improve, if anything. Okay, so that's the main punchline of the analysis of KVV. And I'm gonna skip some of the calculation because now that we have a full characterization of the matching quality, then I can literally just write down how much gain that they get. So for example, uh, V always matches to someone whose uh, match quality is at least as good as theta. So by definition, it's going to get, get one minus the price function when the rank is actually theta, okay? And from the offline vertex use point of view, it's going to get matched when its rank is less than theta. So that means that the expected amount of gain that it's going to get is the integration from zero to theta, which is the, the region, the, the rank interval under which U is going to get matched. And when it gets matched, it's going to get its own price, right? So it's going to get the PY when its rank is Y. So uh, it's a simple calculus to calculate that, okay, according to these gains, then the expected amount of gain that UMV collects together is at least one minus one over E. And that, that's basically the, the end of the analysis. So how do you convert this claim to the compare ratio is the following. Well, if you look at the total amount of gain given by the algorithm, you can instead count the total gain collected by the vertices because by definition, every time you match a edge, you're basically distributing one unit of gain between the two endpoints. So counting number of edges is the same as counting the gain of the vertices. Now, instead of counting the gain of the vertices on a vertex by vertex, uh, basis, I can instead just look at an arbitrary matching, in, in particular the optimal one, and for each edge in this matching, I count the gain of its two endpoints. Because this is a matching, I'm going to count each vertex at, at most once. And finally, uh, for each edge, I'm going to use the claim that I just showed you. For every single edge, the expected amount of gain of the two endpoints U and V is going to sum up to at least one minus one over E, and then this is at least one minus one of E times the number of edges in the optimal matching. So of course the, the choice of the, uh, this price function is something that's driven by the analysis. It's a simple uh, differential equation that you need to solve. But other than that, uh, now everything that KVV showed uh, 30 years ago can fit in in a few slides. Okay, so um, that's the basics. Uh, now I'm gonna spend a like 10 minutes also to on each of these topic and try to give you one um, main challenge in each of these directions and hopefully give you one idea from each direction. All right, so um, one of the reason why online matching become a very important topic in online, mat uh, online algorithm literature is because that of the, the applications in uh, online advertising, such as in one of these uh, search engines. And in this application, we should imagine the offline vertices as advertisers who would like to show their ads to different users. And the online vertices are basically the search queries that users submit. And when you submit a search query, you get a bunch of organic results, but you also get some sponsor results, which are basically advertisers ads. And these online queries are really showing up one by one. And when an online query is get submitted, you need to immediately decide which ad to show because each of these search query has to be answered within milliseconds. So you cannot wait to see what future queries may come. But in this application, it's not just the cardinality of the matching. Uh, quite naturally, you would imagine that different advertisers would like to pay different amount for different keywords. And the advertisers also would set a budget uh, either in terms of how much money it's going to pay within a single day, or the maximum number of um, shown of their ads uh, within a single day, right? You can imagine this kind of contract. So we need to consider uh, more general objectives. Um, in particular, there are two models, uh, display ads and uh, AdWords. In these display ads, 
uh, we're going to allow each advertiser to have a different value for different queries based on the relevance of the keywords and so on. And we are also going to have a cap CU on the number of display of its ads, let's say within a single day. Okay. And in this case, we want to maximize the total weight of the other ads that we show. But it turns out that model is really hard. And when Feldman et al. in 2009 introduced this model, they introduced one caveat called the free disposal model. It's saying that, okay, I can dis dispose previously cheaper edges to make room for new and more expensive edges. But at the first glance, this may seem like we're cheating. Uh, we are making the problem easier and it's not really an online problem, but it is based on a valid observation that what the advertiser care about is not actually capping the number of display of their ads. What they're trying to cap is the number of displays that they need to pay for. If I'm only paying for one ad and you show my ad a million times, I'm really happy. So what this free disposal is saying is that I may actually show your ad more times than the CEO, but I'm only going to charge you for the most valuable CEO display of your ads. And therefore you're not paying too much. So that's the beauty of the free disposal. Uh, it makes the problem tractable and also um, make, make sense in the actual application. An alternative model called Edwards, uh, introduced by Meta as a Barry Vazrani and Vazrani, while it is very similar, uh, each advertiser may have different values for different displays. Um, this time, the cap is not on the number of displays of their ads, but more directly on the total amount that they are going to pay for within a single day called a budget. So if I have some kind of allocation of online vertices to offline vertices or the displays to, um, to different advertisers, then at the end of the day, each advertiser is going to either pay the total value of the displays of their ad or the budget, whichever is. So you can see that there are two uh, somewhat different models trying to model different scenarios in online advertising and both models are very uh, practically relevant and actually proposed by uh, researchers from Google. And actually both, both problems share a similar state of the art. Um, before, until two years ago, only a simple 0.5 comparative greedy algorithm is known for the most general case. Um, there are, has been some results if we're willing to make additional assumptions, but for the most general problem that only one half comparative ratio is known. And on the other hand, there's no evidence that the problem is any harder than the original unweighted by pattern matching problem by Kavas running was running in the sense that people are still hoping that one month from every compared ratio uh, is achievable. And there's no counter example for that. And the main difficulty of generalizing the technique uh, by Kavas Rani was running is that the characterization of a, the alternating part is going to fail. Okay. So imagine I have a blue matching or blue allocation, and now I have a new vertex who become popular enough to join the matching, join the allocation process. Now notice that in each of these two problems, an offline vertex and advertiser can be matched or can be allocated to multiple times. Now in the case of display ad, it is because it is the free disposal model, and therefore you can keep matching more and more valuable edges to the same advertiser. And in the AdWords setting, well, by definition, you can match multiple times because of this budget and each ad displays value could be smaller than the budget. So with this new vertex you involve, then it can actually grab more than one uh, original allocation in the blue allocation and becomes the yellow one. And the problem here is that this is not the only thing that it triggers, right? Now, each of these U1, U2, and UK can further trigger multiple changes and now you have this cascading effect, the whole change in the allocation is no longer a simple alternating part, but something really complicated to handle in the analysis. So that is what I consider the most uh, challenging obstacle in generalizing KVV to uh, these two problems. Okay, so how, how we make some progress on these two problems is by, in some sense, going back to the basic and come up with a less elegant analysis for the original KBB uh, model. And then this less elegant approach somehow is more generalizable to these two uh, alternative problems, this uh, two problem display ads and AdWords. So let's revisit the naive uh, randomized greedy algorithm. 
But one thing that we notice is that um, the wrong choices, at some point you will notice that the wrong choices actually had many, many opportunity in the past. And in some sense, they actually enough information to tell the algorithm which are the wrong choices or which are the right choices. The only reason that the algorithm is making getting only one half is because it's completely um, oblivious to this kind of information. So based on this observation, we propose a alternative imaginary algorithm called two choice greedy. So when each online vertex arrive, I'm going to look at all the neighbors and see which two neighbors has the fewest pass opportunity. Okay, breaking pass opportunity. And then I'm going to um, randomly choose one of these two neighbors, each with 50% probability. And of course, if there's a one unique neighbor that has been tried the least number of times and there's no other neighbor has the same number of previous opportunity, then I'm gonna simply match to this least try neighbor with certainty, but that's sort of the corner case. Uh, and it's not too relevant for what we're going to discuss next. Okay, so now come back to this um, example. You will see that, okay, at the beginning, well, the first one, and let's say we're unlucky and it actually shortlist two blue vertices in the bottom and they match to one of them uh, uniformly at random. And then when the second one arrives, there's still enough blue vertices that have not been shortlisted in this two choice algorithm, I still make a mistake. But the point here is that after the first half of the top right yellow vertices, then all the blue vertices in the bottom, even you're very unlucky, have been tried at least once. And then in the second half, this two choice greedy algorithm is going to find the correct choice as the unique least try neighbor and match it to that neighbor with certainty. So the first half still make mistake, the second half choose correctly and the ratio improved to at least three quarter. So that's sort of a good sign and say that, okay, maybe there's something along this line. But there's something that un unspecified in this two choice greedy algorithm because I haven't tell you how I'm gonna choose between the two least try neighbor randomly. Well, for a single round, I have to tell you that I'm gonna choose with equal probability 50-50, but am I gonna use this randomness independently across different rounds, or am I going to use some non-trivial correlation just like ranking? That's something that I haven't specified yet. Um, I'm gonna skip the calculation here, but the, what I'm trying to show here is that if you actually use independent randomness in each round, then you can actually uh, play with the example a little bit and show that, okay, still you cannot get something better than one half. So introduce some correlation is essential in this process. So I want the random choice across different rounds to be correlated. Now, what kind of correlation do I want? Well, intuitively, I want perfect negative correlation. If an element was shortlisted last time and wasn't selected, then this time I should choose that element, right? And with perfect negative correlation, then I'm essentially ensuring that each element is going to be selected with certainty after two shortlists, okay? So that's the ideal situation. And well, the good news here is that if I can actually achieve the perfect negative correlation, then uh, it's not too hard to show that uh, you can beat the one half ratio. The bad news is that the perfect negative correlation is impossible to achieve in the online setting. Um, I'm gonna show you with a very simple example. Let's say in the first round, you shortlist A and B and choose randomly. In the second round, you shortlist two other vertices C and D and you still choose randomly. Now let's imagine two possible future scenario. In 3A, you're shortlisting B and C, okay? Let's analyze this a little bit. If step one picks A, meaning that it did not pick B. Now by perfect negative correlation, step three, has to choose B, right? That's the second time that B appears. But that also means that C is not selected in step three. Now, once again, by perfect negative correlation, step two must choose C, make sense? But this is not the only possible future. Or it, it is also possible that in step three, the two elements that get shortlisted are B and D, right? Now you can apply a symmetric argument and reach the conclusion that if step one pick A, then step two must pick B. But what this suggests is here is that depending on what the third step look like, you need to have the complete opposite kind of correlation between step one and step two. 
And that's impossible to do, right? Because by the time of step two, oh, you don't really know what step three look like. So this is not possible to achieve in, uh, in the online setting. And in fact, even in the offline setting, uh, this kind of perfect negative correlation is not achievable. Uh, the intuition behind this is that, well, the thing about negative correlation is that if events A and B are negative correlated and B and C are negative correlated, sometimes when the negative correlation are strong enough, then that you can deduce that A and C has to be positively correlated. So it's sort of like multiplying two negative number give you a positive number. Okay, so now we have to find the middle ground here. How about partial negative correlation? So uh, this would bring us to the concept of uh, online correlated selection, a technique that we introduced about uh, two years ago. So um, we actually abstract out the uh, online matching background and try to uh, model this as a separate problem. So let's say your online correlated selection is a online problem where you take a sequence of pair of elements as input, one pair at a time. And these elements basically correspond to the offline vertices in the online matching problems. Now, my requirement is that for each pair, you basically want to select with a marginal distribution that's 50-50 because that's how I want things to be. But for any fixed element, the randomness across different rounds that it is involved in has to be negative correlated. If it wasn't chosen this time, then it should get a higher chance next time. Now to quantify this, uh, in that paper, we introduced this so-called gamma OCS, or uh, it's actually a gamma semi-OCS for technical reason, but I don't want to bug you with the detail here. So in this definition, if an element is has appeared in k different pairs in your input sequence, then I want the probability that it never gets chosen to be at most two to the minus k times one minus gamma to the power of k minus one. So how to interpret this? Well, if gamma is zero, then this is simply two to the minus k, and this is what you would achieve by using an independent coin flips in each round, because every single time you get a one half chance of selecting this element. So after k rounds, even if you use independent randomness, well, you, you will have at most two to the power minus k probability of not selecting the element. And on the other hand, if gamma equals one, then this basically says that after the second try, then you have to select it. So when gamma is between zero and one, this is sort of an interpolation between independent randomness and the perfect correlation, which is not achievable as I just show you. So I would like to design on our algorithm to achieve gamma OCS guarantee for as large of a gamma as possible. Um, I won't be able to show you the algorithm, but I, I, I'm gonna show you the, what we know about gamma OCS and then uh, what, it can, what it implies in the online matching problems. So um, gamma equals zero is true. Gamma equals one is impossible. And actually by working with the example that I show you a little bit, then you can actually show that uh, even one half is impossible, okay? Um, and then um, in the original paper, we give essentially a 0.1 OCS, uh, which means that, okay, you have some non-trivial negative correlation, but still very far from the upper bound that you, would, um, you can show. And in subsequent work, uh, this, margin has been uh, narrow into uh, between uh, 0.16 and 0.25. So now we have better understanding of how much correlation you can possibly introduce in this process. And um, this is basically the state of the art for the two choice option. And what it implies in two problems that I showed you earlier is that it allow us to break the one half barrier. So for uh, the, the actual numbers are not too important, but I just want to say that uh, for both the display ads and AdWords option, uh, uh, this OCS technique will allow you to design two choice randomized algorithm that has a compare ratio that is strictly better than one half. Uh, even though the margin is small and it's not quite get to one minus one over E, well, it is better than the, the first breakthrough over one half. So uh, I think there's still a lot of room of improvement uh, along this direction. And one particular potential uh, improvement direction is the multi-way option because uh, what well, restricting to having two candidate options in each round is really an artifact of the thought experiment that we have at the beginning. Uh, there's no real reason of restricting ourselves to having only two candidates in each round. So uh, one may guess uh, if we can actually generalize this technique to uh, allow having multiple candidates and still introduce negative correlation 
uh, of the randomness in different rounds, then maybe we can get better ratios. And there has been some partial progress um, in two papers appear in Fox 2021, but the conference is actually earlier this year, 2022. Um, well, basically there has been multi-way online correlated selection algorithms that have been proposed recently. And indeed that allow us to improve the compatible ratio in uh, different online matching problems. Um, once again, here you can see the um, reference. And if you're interested, you can find more detail in the paper, but here I'm gonna skip the detail. Okay, now let me move on to the second direction that has seen uh, some recent progress. Uh, basically some more general online matching problems uh, that's applicable to other scenario like right hailing and right sharing. So let's try to first model right hailing as an online matching problem. And now the bipartite graph have drivers on one side and riders on the other side. And imagine that some right hailing platform is going to match the two kind of uh, um, vertices in the graph. Now, at some point, a rider may submit a request to the platform stating, you know, where he wants to be picked up and where it's going to. And at some point, some driver also uh, become available. Maybe he has just, just dropped off the previous rider, or maybe it's a self-employed driver who just, just start working. And at some point, um, you know, some driver may, may, may leave the platform because, well, it just pick up a, a passenger uh, on the street, right? So before the departure of a vertex, the algorithm has to match it. Uh, if otherwise, that, that driver will just leave the system and you don't get a chance to match this driver later. And similarly, at some point, some rider may also cho choose to leave the system. Maybe I choose to take the public transit, right? And before the rider leave, that's the last chance that the algorithm can match the rider to one of the available drivers. So obviously, this is a hugely simplified uh, version of what's actually happening in right hailing. But uh, what I'm trying to get to here is that when I try to think about right hailing as a online bipartite matching problem, the main difference compared to the traditional model is that both sides are online. We can no longer have the luxury of knowing one side completely from beginning to end. And also these vertices are kind of also arriving and also departing over time. Okay, before I get to the model, I, I'm gonna show you something even more general. And let's imagine it's a ride sharing scenario. And this time I'm gonna focus on just matching different riders. I'm actually going to simplify the problem and without worrying how to match pair of riders to drivers, I'm simply matching different riders. And again, at some point various riders will submit requests to the system. And if at some point you find two riders have similar pickup locations, similar destinations, and also their requests are not too far from each other, not when in the morning, not when in the evening, then you can choose to pair them up and serve these two riders with the same taxi or the same self-employed driver. And just like before, at some point, some riders will decide to take the public transit and leave the system. Okay. So what I'm trying to get to here is that in this scenario, first of all, just like before, all the vertices are online and also arriving and departing at different time steps. And moreover, the graph is no longer bipartite. In, in fact, if you have to impose some structural property of this kind of graph, then it's more like some clusters uh, loosely connected by some uh, edges uh, across different clusters because what well, you can imagine that if rider A and rider B can be matched together and rider B and rider C can be matched together then quite likely A and C will probably also have similar pickup locations and destinations and so on. So it's more like a cluster kind of uh, structure. But anyway, uh, as the addition, I'm gonna assume away any you know, structural assumption that we're gonna make. Uh, the, what I'm trying to get to here is that we may need a online matching theory that can allow general graphs and arbitrary arrivals and departure of vertices. Uh, so the model that we come up with um, about four years ago is called fully online matching. So um, I have an arbitrary graph and there will be two kinds of time steps. Oh, by the way, right, right from the beginning, I, I know nothing about a graph whatsoever. And there will be two kinds of time steps. Um, each time step is either the arrival of some vertex. And when a vertex arrives, the algorithm will get to observe the edges between this vertex and the previous vertices that have already arrived. 
And a time step can also be the departure or the deadline of some vertex is basically the latest time that you can possibly match this vertex, okay? Um, here we are gonna make the assumption that uh, all the neighbors of a vertex will arrive uh, before the vertex uh, departure. Or another way to put it is that there could be an edge between two vertices only if the active time window of these two vertices actually have some overlap, which in the right hailing and right sharing example, it's basically saying that, okay, if you have two riders, one in the morning and one in the evening, then you cannot really match them, right? I mean, that's the natural assumption. And one maybe not so obvious fact is that um, what this model actually generalizes the cut Vazirani Vazirani model. This may not be obvious because we're introducing new concepts like departures and so on. Um, to see this, basically all the offline vertices are super patient vertices that arrive right at the very beginning and depart only at the very end. And the online vertices are very impatient uh, vertices that arrive and then depart in the next moment. So you're basically forced to match each online vertex right by their arrival. So the Kava Zirani Vazirani can actually be interpreted as a special case of fully online matching uh, with additional uh, structure in the graph. Okay, so well, since ranking works so well in the original model, right? So the natural thing to try is to see if rankings still work here. Um, interestingly, um, the interpretation that we did earlier actually help us generalize ranking. But in the original definition of ranking, I need to know all the vertices and then sort of randomly rank them, sort them, right? and then use that as the priority. But here, all the vertices are arriving online. So how am I supposed to sort all the vertices that I don't know right from the beginning? But the alternative interpretation of sampling a rank uniformly between zero and one for each vertex actually help here because now I can wait until the arrival of vertex before I actually sample this rank YU for this vertex. And that is still effectively the same as sort of ranking all the vertices uniformly at random right from the beginning. So it does actually help generalizing the problem. And um, when a vertex V is, has reached its deadline, has to depart, and it's still unmatched, then at that moment, I'm going to try to match it to an unmatched neighbor. And just like ranking, I'm going to match to the neighbor with the smallest rank, OK? Um, the main idea here is that there are actually some similarity uh, between this and the original ranking problem because when a vertex has to depart, it is actively looking around its neighborhood to see what are the available options and choose one of them. And all the neighbors are just sitting passively waiting to be picked if they're lucky. So from each edge UV's point of view, the vertex that depart earlier who will be actively choosing uh, the other one is sort of the active vertex and the vertex that departs later is the passive vertex. So the key difference here, oh, sorry, uh, let me re remind you. So active vertices, roughly speaking, correspond to the online vertices in the KVV model and passive vertices are approximately the same as the uh, offline vertices in the Kalba Zivari Zivari model. The main difference here is that in the original model, each vertex is assigned a unique row. All the offline vertices are passive from beginning to end. All the online vertices are active. But here, each vertex can have any of these two rows, depending on which edge that we are talking about. For some edges, it's, it is the active vertex. And for some other edges, it may be the passive vertex. So that's the difference here. But this similarity, uh, this similarity will still allow us to um, draw a similar draw ideas from the Kappa's running, running model. For example, uh, now I can still sort of split one unit of gain between the two endpoints based on who is the passive vertex and who is the active vertex and depending on the passive vertex rank. So that's the uh, key idea here. So what do we know? Uh, well, in the original paper, what we show here is that actually there's some interesting um, unique feature about this generalization. So first of all, um, it is not, we are not in the pessimistic world where the only thing that you can do is this simple greedy algorithm and the one half comparative, comparative ratio is the best you can do. If, we, if we're in that world, then it is not too interesting from algorithm designer's point of view because all that you can do is to do greedy, right? So we show that 
uh, for both by product graph and even for general graph, uh, ranking actually give you a compare ratio that's strictly better than one half. So there's actually rooms to explore beyond the greedy algorithm, even in this more general model. Now, on the other hand, uh, we show that the fully online matching problem is strictly harder than the uh, original KBB problem. So in that paper, when we propose the model, we only get to show that, okay, uh, no algorithm can be 0.63. And if you remember what I say, one minus one over E is something like 0.632. So the margin is really small, but conceptually it still says that this problem is strictly harder. So um, we probably will we see some unique ideas to fully settle this problem. Well, and later uh, we uh, improve the analysis of ranking, uh, at least on bipartite graph, and show that uh, it get a tight ratio basically for uh, uh, ranking on bipartite graph. And uh, and then we actually find that okay for this problem. Ranking is not the best algorithm that you can design. Uh, there's actually algorithm whose compare ratio is strictly better than ranking. So once again, I think from a algorithm designer's point of view, this is kind of good news because it really says that there's some unexplored territory that we can get a lot of new understanding about online matching and online algorithm in general by studying this problem. And by the way, uh, there's one working paper on archive that also uh, make the upper bound much closer to 0.6. So right now the margin uh, separating the two model is no longer so small. Uh, I, I forgot to add that reference here. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to skip all the technical part of this. I, I just want to give you the picture and the, um, the big picture and also give you some references. I just want to mention that along the line of considering more general arrival model, uh, fully on our matching is not the on only option. So um, there's also a, a very closely related model called windowed online matching, uh, which is almost the same as fully online matching, but they assume first in first out arrival order, which means that uh, whichever vertex arrive earlier, it's going to depart earlier. And this makes particular sense in the right sharing scenario because each request is sort of staying in the system for a fixed period of time and naturally will at least approximately satisfy this first in first out assumption. And what they get uh, from the first in first out assumption is that they're able to handle edge weighted case, okay? And again, you can imagine that in write sharing, uh, not all writes are equally valuable, like longer writes are going to pay higher. So you can imagine that naturally you will have edge weight and they are, able to get compatible algorithm uh, for the edge weighted case uh, by ass assuming first in first out. And also uh, there are harder cases called uh, general vertex arrival, which basically is uh, similar to fully on a matching, except that there's no such concept as departure of vertex where each vertex arrive, you have to match it immediately. And you cannot sort of wait until it's departure. So it's a harder problem. And even for that problem, um, the state of the art says that you can uh, do better than 0.5, even though the margin is very small. Uh, I think the epsilon is something like uh, one over 10,000 or something like that. Uh, I, I don't remember the precise number, but it's a very small margin. And for the even more general edge arrival model, then uh, we only have, a well, it's actually by others. Uh, the state of the art says that uh, no algorithm can beat greedy. Uh, one half competitive, competitive ratio is the best that you can hope for for the most general case. So again, all of these models are interesting. And um, here you can see the references. And uh, if you're interested, I'm going to refer you to these papers. Uh, finally, I'm going to give a very quick overview of some recent progress in online uh, matching with stochastic information. In particular, I'm going to um, talk about online stochastic matching as the uh, main result that I'm going to share. So you can imagine that um, in the case of matching user queries to different advertisers, such as on uh, search engines, worst case analysis may not be the most accurate model because this company actually have a lot of data about what kind of queries that they received in the past. And they actually do not assume that what they see today is completely arbitrary. It has to bear some similarity of what you see, what kind of queries that you see from yesterday, right? So the most um, benign model trying to capture the usage of this data is the uh, stochastic model, where you have a bipartite graph. The left-hand side are the advertisers. 
the right hand side are sort of the types of online vertices um, or the types of user queries that you're expected to see. And we're going to assume that each online vertex are IID drawn from a known distribution, presumably that you estimate from the previous user data. Um, it's important equivalently, you can also assume that the online vertices are, or each type of online vertices are going to arrive by a Poisson process, um, but I'm not going to get to that. And even more generally, you can imagine that in this scenario, it's not really IID, right? Like the kind of user queries that you see in the morning may not be the same as the kind of user queries that you see in midnight. So you can also imagine that there can, can be some time dependent distribution and based on this stochastic information, you want to make online decisions of matching user queries to different uh, advertisers. Uh, so this is sort of the uh, stochastic version of online matching. Um, and well, in some sense, in the stochastic model, you have all the information that you need to solve the problem exactly if you don't care about computational power. Because what well, just like Dr. Strange in the movie, right? You, you have enough stochastic information to deduce what are the possible future and what's the likelihood of each possibility. And you can just run a backward induction to get what are the best decisions that you can make in each of these scenarios. So computational power aside, you can actually solve this problem exactly. But um, we don't have unlimited computational power. so. In reality, the, the algorithm in the literature generally will first consider some LP relaxation, linear program relaxation of the problem, solve the linear program, and then hopefully this linear program solution is going to guide our online decision. Uh, the, the LP solution is going to have the form that, well, I have a variable XUV for each offline vertex and each type of online vertex, and that the value of that variable is sort of indicating how likely I should match a online vertex of type V to offline vertex U. So hopefully I can get this kind of information by solving the linear program. Um, the simplest kind of uh, linear program that you can write is the matching linear program. So here XUV is what I explained. The objective is simply the weighted sum of these uh, decision variables, WUV times XUV summing over all the possible pairs. And for each online type, the total amount of match cannot exceed the arrival rate of the vertex because each arrived vertex can be only matched once. And each offline vertex only can also be matched once. So the sum of XUV for different uh, online type cannot exceed one. So that's the natural way that you can write ALP. But it just turns out that uh, this LP is too simple to be useful. Uh, we actually need more uh, sophisticated LP uh, so, for example, um, in this paper from last year, um, we improved the LP constraint to be the following. Essentially, we are saying that for each offline vertex U and each subset of online type S, okay, the total amount of match that can happen between U and online types in S, well, cannot really exceed the probability that you actually get at least one vertex with types uh, in S, right? If you have no vertices of types in S, you should not be able to match between you and these vertices. So this is a very um, conservative, conservative way of introducing uh, further constraints, but it just turns out that this kind of constraint uh, is already very powerful to allow us to make better decisions. And this year we sort of make this LP even more expressive, uh, introduce more uh, complicated uh, constraints, but that's kind of the theme in the previous years, uh, in, in the past few years. We try to introduce more expressive linear programs for these online matching problems with expressive, uh, with stochastic information, and hope that these linear programs will allow us to make better decisions. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, much of the technical detail, and uh, you can find the references and uh, in, in in the slides. Uh, I, I believe will be made available. Um, so and also. Uh, what I talk about is not the only kind of uh, stochastic model. Uh, you can, uh, instead of assuming stochastic information, you can assume only random arrival order, but still adversarial graph. Uh, you can also have uh, the match success is also stochastic because in online advertising, uh, they run this paper click model. In other words, the search engine only collect money 
if the user actually click on the ad and that happens as a probabilistic, uh, probabilistic process. So uh, stochastic reward is another uh, very important one. Okay, so uh, I, I guess I used too much time, uh, but let me stop here and um, maybe take some questions if we still have time to what, for one or two questions. Yep, uh, so thanks for Zhi's uh, very great talk. So I think due to the schedule, maybe we can just take one quick question. Right, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, so any question from the uh, audience? Um, yeah, probably I have one quick question. So, so I think uh, there are uh, some uh, new uh, trend on online algorithm called the online algorithm with prediction in recent years. Right. So probably right. I think you know there are several papers uh, studying right. online matching with predictions. So do you have right. any like comments or uh, because they kind of like a prediction on vertex degree on uh, some kind of graph properties. So uh, right. any ideas or suggestions if people want to study like learning augmented algorithm for online matching? Well, I, I think that's a very promising um, direction, uh, online algorithm with prediction. And um, actually for online matching, when I study algorithms uh, that are derived from the worst case analysis model, I often find that uh, in practice, there are very simple heuristics that are performing at least as well, if not better yeah. than the theoretical algorithm that we derive. So that kind of suggests that in many scenarios, maybe uh, the worst case analysis that we study may not be the best model to approach yeah. this uh, very yeah. application-driven uh, problem. Yeah. So I think uh, on an algorithm with prediction is really uh, trying to build in this uh, machine learning-based uh, information that you would derive uh, in, in practice and try to, well, I think uh, one, one theme is to get sort of a robust uh, usage of these predictions. So if, if they're accurate, then you get better results than the worst case analysis. But even when they are not accurate, you still at least get some provable comparative ratio. I think that's really, uh, I think the well, important future direction for, for all online uh, algorithm problems. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much.